Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ryan Berg, and I'm a senior fellow with the CSIS Americas program and also director of the Future of Venezuela initiative at CSIS. Thank you for joining us this morning for a conversation on sharpening the democracy playbook, a practical approach for Venezuela. Before we begin, let's take care of some logistics. This discussion will last approximately 90 minutes. Following the panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions link on the event webpage, or use the Ask Questions function in Zoom. Today, we will have simultaneous interpretation. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, please click the globe button that says Interpretation, and then select the language you wish to listen in. Ahora para nuestra audiencia hispanohablante. Hoy tendremos interpretación simultánea. En el recuadro, recuadro de la pantalla de Zoom encontrarán un icono con una esfera que dice Interpretation. Ahí, por favor, seleccione el idioma de su preferencia. Again, thank you for joining us this morning for a conversation on the democracy playbook in Venezuela. Authoritarian regimes are on the rise across the world. Democratic institutions have been severely weakened by dictators who employ a shared playbook for consolidating power and suppressing dissent. In Venezuela, the Maduro regime has executed the dictator's playbook to the letter, while pursuing closer integration with a network of global authoritarians. A major step toward confronting the rise of dictatorships would be to sharpen a counter playbook, that is, a playbook for the defenders of democracy internationally. The success of democratic movements is closely linked across international borders, with moments of democratization often occurring in waves that tend to sweep multiple countries. Therefore, within the Americas region, the struggle for democracy in Venezuela seems to represent a vital starting point for formalizing any democracy playbook. Furthermore, Lessons learned in Venezuela could help build a successful counter narrative to rising authoritarianism, both regionally and around the world. In their quest to consolidate power, authoritarians often alter the electoral system by reducing the independence of electoral commissions and implementing new voting laws that favor incumbents. This is normally followed by the weakening of civil society and a persistent dismantling of institutional checks and balances. Finally, Authoritarians often seek to control the judiciary, the military, the police, and any other institution that represents an alternative center of political and social organization. In Venezuela, the Nicolas Maduro regime has executed the dictator's playbook to the letter, even adding chapters of its own, while also pursuing closer integration with a network of global authoritarians. Faced with these well-adapted maneuvers, opposition groups and democracy movements must counter the global rise of authoritarians with their own democratic playbook. In going on the offensive, democracies and opposition movements should be prepared to define democratic warning signs and call them out when they occur. To go on even more of an offensive, democracies should implement policies like diplomatic isolation, targeted individual sanctions, and a commitment to work with civil society to resolve democratic deficits. Today, we will discuss the, the practical ways in which the Venezuelan opposition, democratic leaders in the Western Hemisphere, civil society, multilateral organizations, and the private sector can utilize tools from the democracy playbook to begin restoring Venezuela's democracy and create space for more competitive, free, and fair elections in 2024. To help us think through the democracy playbook, we have an excellent set of speakers to discuss some of the key elements of the playbook and explore the ways in which the US government the international community and the Venezuelan opposition can work together to counter the Maduro regime. Our first speaker today is Jose Ignacio Hernandez, former special prosecutor for the interim government of Venezuela. He is a visiting fellow at the Harvard Growth Lab and is a professor of administrative law at the University at the Universidad Central de Venezuela and the Universidad Católica Andres Bello in Venezuela. He has written more than 100 academic articles and 14 books. Our second speaker is Alexandra Winkler, non-resident senior associate with the CSIS Americas program, a former deputy mayor of El Atillo, one of five municipalities of the capital city of Caracas, Venezuela. Within that role, she was recognized for her social policy innovations and promotion of public-private partnerships to alleviate the impact of one of the worst humanitarian crises in the Western Hemisphere. And our third speaker is Christopher Sabatini, Senior Research Fellow for Latin America, U.S. and the Americas Program at Chatham House, and formerly a lecturer in the School of International and Public Affairs, known as SIPA, at Columbia University. He also serves on the advisory boards of Harvard University's LASPO, the 
Advisory Committee for Human Rights Watch's Americas Division, and the Inter-American Foundation. Thank you all for taking the time to discuss the Democracy Playbook in Venezuela with us this morning. Without further ado, over to you, Jose Ignacio, for your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Ryan. It is a pleasure to be here today discussing the Democracy Playbook for Venezuela, particularly regarding the 2024 presidential elections. I will explain briefly why, in my opinion, under the current conditions and sets of incentives, the 2024 elections could be another failed attempt to bring democracy back to Venezuela. I have characterized Venezuela as a failed case of democratization by elections. Since 2004, the theory of change adopted by the opposition has been to promote a transition through elections, but each election has been a step towards authoritarianism. The electoral triumph of the opposition in the 2015 parliamentary elections didn't advance democracy. On the contrary, that elections ended the competitive authoritarianism in Venezuela and triggered an authoritarian path that ended in crimes against humanity, transnational cryptocracy, a complex humanitarian emergency, and the worst migrants and refugees crisis in the world. And now, once again, it seems that the transition strategy is focused on the 2024 presidential elections. It is necessary to recall the nature of Maduro's regime. It is, of course, an authoritarian populist regime, but it's something even worse. A criminal elite that has gained economic power as a result of the collapse of the state and the increasing de facto dollarization, as I explained in one of my recent books. This diagnosis is does not intend to polarize the debate in Venezuela or annihilate Maduro's coalition. Our interest is to understand the incentive the ruling coalition could have to negotiate reasonable electoral conditions. In our opinion, there are no clear incentives, among other reasons, because political motivations tend to be less efficient in solving non-political problems, as are the problems related with the organized crimes that the ruling elite has created over the ruins of the Venezuelan fragile state. But also, Maduro's regime seems to have better alternatives to a negotiated agreement, and I will mention only two. First, uh, incentive that had Maduro to avoid a negotiation. The Venezuelan narrative is changing. Instead of talking about gross human rights violations and justice, now the main topics of discussions are economic recovery, the creation of special economic zones, and the extraordinary increase in oil production that would follow oil license. Without real concessions, Maduro has been able to reduce the pressures derived from his criminal and kleptocratic behavior. Rather than negotiate genuine electoral reforms or genuine economic improvements towards a stable and inclusive development, the best alternative to Maduro is to keep fostering this new narrative in an example of the path truth, one of the global threats to democracy recently identified by Moises Naim. I will uh, follow to the second reason why, in my opinion, Maduro doesn't have any incentive to negotiate. The main legal barrier that prevents Maduro from accessing external assets is the international recognition of the interim president. Based on Article 233 of the Venezuelan Constitution, the status of the interim president must be preserved until free and fair presidential elections are called. Hence, the constitutional status creates incentives to negotiate those electoral conditions, considering the 2024 presidential election. But the constitutional status of the interim president could disappear, not as a result of Maduro's action, but paradoxically, due to the unconstitutional decisions adopted by the fourth legislature of the National Assembly. Recently, the National Assembly decided to substitute the constitutional authority of the interim president regarding external assets with an unconstitutional asset council. And in any case, according to the last reform of the democratic transition, the mandate of the National Assembly and the interim president will expire on January the 5th, 2023. Maduro doesn't have to return to Mexico to improve the probabilities of regaining control over external assets. His best alternative is just to wait until the National Assembly suppress 
one of the most appropriate incentive for a negotiated solution based on the 2024 presidential elections. The final report of the electoral observation missions conducted by the European Union has an accurate assessment of the electoral malpractices that must be addressed in Venezuela. However, as I explained, Maduro has no incentive to enter into a genuine negotiation that solve at least the most relevant malpractices. Under this scenario, the 2024 presidential election will be another failed attempt to advance in a democratic playbook in Venezuela. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jose Ignacio, for your opening remarks. Over to you, Alex, for yours. Thanks, Ryan, and thank you to CSIS Americas for the invitation to be in today's panel. I know, Ryan, that today's event is to talk about the democracy playbook, but I think it's so hard to talk about that playbook when first there really isn't today a strategy to regain democracy in Venezuela and a huge vacuum of leadership to attain it. And this is hard to say and it's hard to swallow because we've been in this fight for the past 24 years. But I think we have to face the ugly hard truth that to develop a democracy playbook in Venezuela we first need to be sincere about La Unidad. And when I say La Unidad, it's the democratic unity platform, the one we've been all rallying around for so long, because today it's it's just not working anymore. And it's not holding to the standards that the Venezuelan people deserve to regain democracy. And I think there needs to be this tough discussion around how to maybe dissolve and disarticulate La Unidad and redefine its purpose and its structure. And I know this can sound wildly controversial, but I, Alexandra, believe in the concept of unity to accomplish freedom and democracy in Venezuela. And without it, we're not going anywhere. But that concept of unity has not been translated into positive execution. And what's been lingering around is this false unity, which has endured so long because of weakened and manipulated structures of the political opposition of today. And you might want to ask why, and I'll give you four reasons for that. First, the political opposition has no consensus of purpose and objectives because it's torn between those who want Maduro to leave and those who want Maduro to coexist with them. Because today there is a false opposition with Alacranes who directly negotiate with Maduro. We have to be you know, real about that. Second, the opposition is kidnapped and bound by the decision of four political parties with no real inclusiveness of private sector, civil society, NGOs, I mean, I think La Unidad needs to be suprapartido, a structure above all political parties, to include all Venezuelan stakeholders. Three, opposition leaders, and this is hard to say, but I feel like opposition leaders today have used La Unidad to perpetuate themselves within their own political parties. And they hypocritically talk to the people about unity, but when it comes to the G4, they don't trust each other. They're incapable of having a face-to-face -face conversation like we're having today, and especially one in favor of our country. And then that bears to my fourth reason or bears to the question that if they don't trust themselves, then how do they expect the public to do so? The opposition has no legitimacy today as it's structured and less to run for an election in 2024. And this is not just something Alex is saying here at CSIS. I mean, recent polling data in Venezuela by Delphos is saying that despite 72% of the population wants Maduro to leave, when they were asked to identify the leader of the opposition today, more than 40% of the people said there was none. Why? Because Venezuelans don't want to vote for the same exact candidates who have been running for president over the past 18 years. The same guy who ran in 2006, today's the strongest opposition option for 2024. And I think that's just ridiculous and it's embarrassing. So with this, I'll just try to conclude and say that to strengthen the democracy playbook, you know, the opposition needs to look in internally and really make it a priority to renew leadership. And, it, and renewing leadership has to be at the center because it's not only the regime who has been bad at that, it's also the opposition who has failed at that too. And to be fair, we can't expect a general remedy from the political parties. Um, we need leadership to renew across all sectors. We need it to come from the private sector, Big companies, big NGOs are still in hands of their founders. Unions still rally up around the same guys. And my question is, when are we giving the next generation a chance? So I know democracy is not perfect, but people are at, the, are at the heart of democratic improvement. And if the Venezuelan people don't call out 
those who need to take a step back because they can't leave their egos aside, then the idea of a democratic Venezuela won't really become a reality. And it will only just come to life in black and white in a playbook. And I think that all Venezuelan people deserve more than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for, for your statement. Uh, lots on the table there for you, Chris. Over to you for, for your opening remarks. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for the invitation. So I, I planned this a little bit more around uh, two articles that Ryan and I have co-authored uh, on the Democrats playbook. And so what I'm going to do, I agree with everything that's been said before by the two previous speakers, um, but what I want to do is put more of a positive spin, or at least a sort of a, a positive, maybe too strong a word, at least more of a proactive spin on what that would mean in defining what would be a Democrats playbook. Because as Ryan said, we've seen this over and over again. And I would argue that the US and other countries and neighbors have failed to respond, even going back to Venezuela when a former US ambassador said loudly and oddly, aggressively and proudly that just watch what he does, not what he says. Well, we know this, Let's we knew it then too, is he will do what he says. Chavez did what he said he was going to do. Most elected autocrats are gonna do what they say. So the first thing is take these elected autocrats their word. The second is I think we need to have some sort of defined playbook um, that responds to these very um, obvious, well-worn paths and patterns that we've seen. Ryan is a cheesehead. He's a big Packers fan. Um, and it's, you know, to make a, 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 a U.S. football reference, um, you know, if, if, if an offense is running a West Coast offense, then you better have a playbook and a defense that responds to that. And so what would that mean? The first is, is we know the institutions that get, tend to get attacked oftentimes in the same order, but not always. And so we need to unpack what those steps of erosion are. The first is elections, and that's obviously undermining the independence of the election council, undermining the autonomy to make decisions of the electoral council, um, the uh, arbitrary use of the electoral council's authority to deny candidates the right to run or de-enlist parties, um, an ineffective monitoring or sanctioning of the use of public resources and coercion to, uh, uh, to, to favor votes and candidates. The next step is obviously the judiciary, independent judiciary is, or independent means of nominating, confirming justices become undermined. Um, temporary justices become sort of the go-to um, rather than permanent justices. Um, enforcement of basic sort of human rights such as habeas corpus um, become denied and not enforced, right, right illegal uh, right to um, protest against illegal search and seizure. All these are steps that we can identify. Media's neck, civil society, denial of funding for civil society groups on the outside are all pretty clear steps. So what can the international community, and I'll bring this back to Venezuela in a second, what can the international community do? Um, it's obviously difficult because we're dealing with a much more divided regional international community when it comes to liberal norms than say in 1999, uh, post Chavez. Um, and so it's going to be difficult. Uh, the uh, the Inter-American Charter, much as it was celebrated in 2001, is clearly not working um, for reasons of the divisions within the hemisphere. And that, so I think increasingly there's several things that need to be done. The first is in the steps that I articulate and others that could be defined is begin to collect a group of friends, uh, if you will, within the region and also within Europe and the Americas, the US, Canada, um, other places that sort of commit to understanding, calling out, articulating, and even responding to, if even in writing, to this list of steps of erosion of democracy that is the dictator's playbook. Um, what could this could be is sort of, obviously, a group of friends, to, to quote, sort of a group of friends with, with consequences, to quote the other term, friends with benefits, this would be friends with consequences. What that means is you actually articulate clearly, these are the steps we know that, that happen, and while not in every case that would warrant a sanction or diplomatic isolation, it would at least warrant a calling out. Now, I realize you know, if you overcommit in terms of threatening sanctions and you can't deliver, those the threat is obviously undermined. Um, but if you at least call it out, and the truth is that for many of these cases, let's take Nicaragua after, I mean, with the manipulation of the electoral standards that brought Ortega back to power and then the uh, constitutional reform, um, obviously, we knew precisely where this country tragically was heading, and no one said anything. It's precisely even just saying something begins to provide a voice to those people who are suffering and seeing um, how the movie is going to end for them and their families. And so the first step is actually articulating what that means. The second is committing to calling it out. The third is, is then beginning to articulate a tightening, basically, vice on the government and on officials that pursue it 
um, in sanction, targeted sanctions, diplomatic isolation, and eventually economic sanctions. Now, the problem today is we could argue that in part, this is what the Biden administration is doing, but it's not. What we see precisely now in case of Central America and recently in Paraguay for some bizarre reason are just sanctions applied willy nilly. Um, maybe for good reasons. The sanctions applied to the El Salvadoran Supreme Court makes sense, but they simply are not done within a larger context that serves as a warning sign for other countries and aspiring autocrats not to follow that path. Why, for example, we sanctioned, we being the United States, um, Cartes and the Paraguayans is unclear in the relative context of other democratic challenges within the region. So consequently, we right now are just simply applying sanctions without any sort of sense of, of context policy implications, and sort of a larger view in what the implications would be. That's the democratic playbook. So what does this mean in terms of Venezuela? Now, obviously, Venezuela is well past any sort of authoritarian playbook. It's already pretty much, it, it's the authoritarian Bible at this point. Um, so the question is, what can be done? And you know, here, I, I would disagree slightly with my friend Nacho, and I, I, I agree with him. Maduro has no incentive to negotiate, absolutely none economically and yeah you're right unfortunately the narrative is there's an economic recovery we all know those who follow venezuela that economic recovery is limited um prejudicial unequal um and completely false I mean, it's not based on any real economic boom but that's become the narrative question though is how do we move away from and he can that can sustain him indefinitely the question is then how do we move and recapture the narrative away from that towards um discussing the elections and i do think you know First of all, I think it's important to participate in elections, even if they're patently unfair, given certain conditions. So I think the two things that have to be done in this particular case, so first of all, not jettison automatically the idea of elections. I don't know of any democratic transition that's taken place as a result of boycotting elections. I can't think of one. I may be wrong, but I can think of others where they have it has taken place or at least eroded, even in Turkey. But the question here is the democratic opposition, in whatever form, and I agree with Alex that they need to unify and be more clear, needs to start to ask for a return of the EU electoral mission. It was criticized in November 2021 elections, but Nacho, as you said, it produced an excellent report. The seven steps that Isabel Santos lays out should be the basis for the democratic opposition's demands on the government. And they should also then identify what should be the minimal conditions of those seven steps it will accept, and it should ask the EU to return. I'll just leave quickly, I know I've spoken too much, but on that point, but I do think we now, uh, well, there's no leverage over the Maduro government. There never really is. Let's be honest. It's a criminal regime, the way Nacho said. But there is more leverage internationally now. And I do think, you know, rather than dismissing the potential of these 2024 elections, which, yes, the cards are stacked against them, no doubt. But there is an opportunity, and there's a certain amount of international leverage, to create that group of friends with consequences. And even in this case, maybe with benefits. Um, when it comes to the elections and what we can demand around those elections internationally, and what the consequences can be. And that means, in fact, not necessarily, if sanctions have been lifted, snapping them back in place by 2024 if they're not, uh, if those conditions haven't been met. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much, Chris, for your opening remarks. So I want to I want to jump right into uh, the moderated portion of our discussion and ask questions that apply to all the panelists. Um, and get your quick takes on, on a couple different points. So one thing that was mentioned in the opening remarks was uh, broadening the aperture in terms of the uh, what the opposition looks like, uh, and not just opposition in terms of political parties, but civil society, private enterprise. Alex, you mentioned this in your opening remarks of, of, of a sort of new definition of, of opposition and broadening of, of that definition. So how should a democracy playbook be established. Chris talked a little bit about what he thought, you know, some of the um, some of the steps would be in some of some of the content, some of the chapters to, to stick with the metaphor. Uh, but who should be involved and what are the principles for the creation thereof? And uh, I'd like to ask you first to, to go Nacho and then and then Alex and then Chris. <clears throat> well, that's a hard question, to be honest. And I and I agree with with um, with the diagnostic that uh, Alex and Christopher have been made in the sense that uh, there is currently no strategy um, in the Venezuelan opposition regarding how to advance in a democracy playbook in Venezuela. And in addition, there are, as I recall, uh, to use a technical name, severe governance failures within the opposition and therefore the fourth legislature of the National Assembly and the interim government. So uh, under this 
chaotic organization, it will be almost impossible to define a credible strategy towards a democracy, a democracy playbook. So I will say that the first uh, reform that uh, there is needed in Venezuela is to uh, reorganize the opposition. But I am not talking about a, a formal change, changing A for B. I am talking about a deep restructuration of the Venezuelan opposition. It is necessary to give more space to civil society. It is necessary to uh, destroy the political monopoly that these four political parties has. And regrettably, I do not see that. I just see the same uh, formalistic uh, changes. And again, uh, it is not only the lack of a strategy, it's the lack of uh, organized civil society and Venezuelan broader opposition movement toward democracy in Venezuela. Uh, and I will say that the first step should be to create a new, genuine, civic uh, opposition compromise uh, with the Venezuelan democratic playbook and not with uh, political and economic interest. Thanks, Nacho. Alex, your thoughts on who should be doing I the mean, training? I absolutely agree with Jose Ignacio. I kind of addressed that a little bit within my opening remarks. I feel like who needs to be involved? Legitimate leaders from all sectors and stakeholders of the Venezuelan society. So that's not just political parties. It's also giving a, a stronger voice to NGOs, to civil society, to unions, to the church, to the private sector, who also needs to be responsible whether they decide to negotiate and do business with Maduro or not. I think they also have to be held accountable. And because everyone has faced this brutal regime and some have not even survived its persecution. So I also think there should be a strong representation of the international community, also going to what Chris was saying before. And just to answer your other question, um, what principles should be considered in you know this playbook? Definitely renewal of leadership, um, respect for human rights, transparency and accountability. And I'd probably end with justice and legality because we have all seen how corruption has permeated all levels, both in the regime and in the opposition, and has kept both standing. So I think that if we don't sanction or call out transgressors on each side, you know, Venezuela will just continue to live in anarchy as it's doing today. Thanks, Alex. Chris, anything to add to those? I would just say uh, I agree with what Nacho and Alex said about the unity of the opposition, although uh, you know, I'm loath and, and I won't criticize in public the opposition because I think uh, you know, being outside, uh, not being Venezuelan, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's difficult to, to, to understand the pressures they're under. Um, you, know, you, you can chalk some of it up to ego. I'm sure a lot of it is. But obviously, I think it's you know, when, when outsiders or non-Venezuelans start to pick apart wh whether Guaido's standing is declining or rising and who's that, I think it's, it's very dangerous. So I'll just say you know, I think there needs to be better representation. How that's done uh, is, is, is a matter that I don't think it's uh, good for me to weigh in on. What I think I can weigh in on is, is the need, again, to sort of put the Maduro regime on its back foot. Put it on its back foot by asking for the international community to be much more, actually also much more unified. And it can be. And, and that's something that you know, I think there's no excuse for. The EU, Canada, the US, you know, even a handful, just small, increasingly smaller handful of Latin American countries need to be very clear about what they're demanding uh, and need to be very clear in the goals. And I think in that case, too, if a unified opposition within Venezuela can make those demands, make the demands that, for example, that an EU mission be allowed to, pre-electoral mission be allowed to attend Venezuela, it puts the Maduro government on its back foot. And that's precisely what it should be seeking to do. Um, but th that's, again, more about the international conditions and coalitions uh, than, than the internal conditions, which, as I say, uh, I, I would be loath to, to, to criticize. It's, it's, I can't imagine, uh, my, you know, the, fa the, the lives, the threats, the, fa the threats on the family that they have to endure have to be uh, uh, very difficult. So it's, it's easier said than done, certainly from an outsider's perspective. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so next, I want to move to a discussion of, about the election itself, because you know, obviously this has been mentioned in uh, the opening remarks. We, we discussed it you know, right away, right out of the gate. It's clear that everybody is, is sort of thinking about 2024 presidential elections, um, assuming they're in 2024 and Maduro doesn't alter the, the schedule, um, because I think there are some in, in some ways a sort of orientation point 
for uh, for policymakers and for people to think about a potential transition uh, in Venezuela, although we've heard Nacho uh, cast a, a good deal of, of reasonable doubt on that. Um, I want to ask you all to weigh in on what we think the most realistic scenario is for, for, for 2024. What, what, what's the most re realistic scenario we can hope for? Um, even if a you know, perfectly clean, free, fair, transparent election is certainly not in the cards. Maduro doesn't have uh, the incentive to negotiate right now as, as, um, as many on the panel have agreed. So what is the most realistic scenario we can hope for? And I'll go in reverse order this time and start with Chris uh, and go back through to Nacho. Oof, realism is not my specialty. Um, the, um, so I think the first is, I mean, I think we have to start with low expectations. Uh, the idea that the Maduro government will recreate a whole new CNE um, would even meet um, half or some imaginary majority threshold of the EU reports recommendations is is folly. Um, but I think there are some minimum conditions that have to be met, and I think the international community has to agree. The one is allowing opposition candidates to run, uh, not disqualifying parties and candidates, and it has to hold the line on those. Um, it has to hold the line on this. The second is is allowing for some uh, um, means of credible international observation. By credible, I don't mean CELAC uh, or uh, any of the other uh, pseudo uh, multilateral organizations that have cropped up in recent years. Um, that's the second. And the third is is some sort of um, conditions. There, there, there is, are cases of violence and coercion by paramilitaries allied with the government that occur in the interior. Um, I think international election observers need to be free to travel around the country, um, need to be able to accompany citizen monitors uh, and protect their freedom. I think those are the basics. Uh, if, if you have that, obviously still no guarantee of, of free and fair elections, um, but at least provide some opening to a process that allows both citizens in Venezuela and international observers to sort of get a peek under the tent of what's going on in terms of the fraud uh, the abuse uh, and the corruption and the criminal criminality that Nacho talked about that occurs. So I think those are the minimum. Um, again, you know, I think we can, the international community and the domestic, domestic opposition can demand things like a completely rejiggered CNE. It should, it won't get them probably, but it should. Um, and, and then begin to go from there. It's, it, it's not just the 2024 elections. You've got, again, in theory, anything can happen. We've seen this. You've got parliamentary elections in 2025. Um, that will be a different kettle of fish. Obviously, uh, many more candidates will be on the ballot. Um, a lot more will be at stake in some cases, um, and not necessarily in the elections, but it won't be a binary choice. Um, there'll be a lot more opportunities for pluralism. And so I'd also keep an eye, not just on the 2024 20, elections, 2025 elections as an opportunity and not sort of lose sight of the fact that there are further elections down and not sort of throw everything out simply because um, the international community, the democratic opposition doesn't get what it wants uh, for, in the lead up to the 2024 elections. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Alex, your thoughts right. on the most realistic scenario? I agree with what Chris said. If the 2024 elections don't make sense, if the basic conditions to guarantee that this process will be free and fair are not going to be met, Chris went into those. I'm going to help you build a scenario with a couple of pros and cons I have on top of mine. Pros, the opposition the opposition has an opportunity to gain trust and legitimacy and you, re, you reunite around a consensus candidate, allowing the opposition to renew its mandate and reconcile its internal divide. Believe me, I have my fingers crossed on that one as much as possible. Two, another pro, there's a chance that the vast majority of Venezuelans who, will, who have grown apathetic about these elections could actually become reconnected to the political process again and that includes the potential to re-engage and reconnect with millions of Venezuelan diaspora across the world and the third pro I'd say is you know the 2024 elections represent an opportunity to re-illustrate the authoritarian nature that Nacho was talking about before of the Maduro regime and actually rally again that currently I want to say half-hearted international support because I think we've all seen that it's kind of dwindling down so those are three pros Three cons. I think Venezuelans have other priorities to survive than caring about elections. And sorry for being blunt again, but there is still a humanitarian crisis. There's huge inflation, which is in American dollars, not in Bolivares, by the way. There's food insecurity. There's poverty. There's ongoing human rights violations. And there's the reality that people prefer to risk their lives 
crossing el Darien and then to stay in Venezuela. So it just goes to show how politics is not on top of mind. Second con, captured institutions, Supreme Court of Justice, CNA, who, yes, they appointed new guys in May 2021, and two of them are opposition, but they're still lax in responding to electoral irregularities and violations and demonstrating transparency. And then, of course, the military, let's, let's not jump into that one. So that's my second con. And my third con is, if we don't renew leadership within the opposition, this process is going to be perceived as biased. This process is going to be perceived as not contributing to renewal of political parties. And it's also going to hurt the legitimacy of the interim government, which I'm sure not just going to be able to address afterwards. But with these pros and cons, the most realistic scenario in Venezuela is the status quo. Like I would say there are no meaningful improvements to the electoral infrastructure um, if the Venezuelan political opposition does not renew itself to bring forth a better candidate then the same guys will run for office and pin the hopes of a country on a sea of change, which I just think is kind of unrealistic and, and irresponsible because Maduro will do whatever it takes to stay in power. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that every single day. Can I just add something, not, not to interrupt Nacho, but also to give him a chance to respond, which I do think what Alex is implying is, is important, is that this, these elections, even if they're, they're completely hijacked, um, laughable as they have been in the past, are a reflection point. They're an opportunity for the, the democratic uh, political opposition to regroup and also, again, regain international support, which has been obviously flagging since the, the 2019 election of Guaido. And this, in, even if in, in that sense, they should be seen as an opportunity. Will they deliver a democratic result? No, probably not. But they are an important opportunity to re- um, an inflection point, actually, to regather international support. And they shouldn't be simply dismissed. But I know Nacho has different views on this, so that's why I wanted to give him a chance to respond. <laughs> Go ahead, Nacho. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Alex and Chris, uh, for, for that. And, and before I uh, kick it over to Nacho for his response, I want to uh, just jump in with a, with a shameful uh, self-plug here for the CSIS Americas program. Yesterday, no, two days ago, sorry, we released a, a report uh, that goes in depth on some of the pros and cons that Alex was talking about in terms of, um, you know, what could happen uh, in this election and tries to sort of game out uh, the probability and the impact of certain scenarios uh, that, that might happen. Uh, over to you, Nacho. Uh, well, as I explained, uh, under the present conditions and set of incentive, 2034 elections uh, would be, probably will be another failed attempt to promote democracy playbook and i and i would like to clarify to chris that i am not advocating as a strategy the electoral boycott uh quoting shakespeare i used to say that participate or not to participate is not the question is the strategy what matters is the strategy and by the way the opposition have never intended an electoral boycott an electoral boycott as we know is an active boycott to the electoral system. What the opposition has been doing, for instance, is say we don't recognize the elections and we're going to our homes and wait, sit down and wait to a miracle to appear. So uh, having said that, and because in a country that doesn't have an effective constitution, 2024 is a constitutional date. Well, it is there. It could be used as an opportunity not to bring democracy through elections, almost impossible under the present condition, but as an opportunity to uh, reform, uh, restructurate the Venezuelan opposition, re-engage Venezuelan citizens with politics, increase the pressure to Maduro's uh, criminality. But at the same time, there is a big risk that if the 2024 elections are conducted under the present narrative, there are going to be a great electoral feast with candidates from the broader opposition promising payment in dollars, everything in dollars, a wonderful country, and we will lose the opportunity to use 2024 elections as a window to demonstrate the criminality of Nicolás Maduro. So I will say that under the uh, proper strategy, yes, for sure, for sure, 2024 elections could be a momentum. But I will uh, finish with this. However, Venezuelan people cannot wait until 2024. So it is necessarily also to try to increase the pressure to provide real solutions to the Venezuelan people, not 
tomorrow, not on 2024, not after the primary of the opposition or whatsoever, here and now, because otherwise it will be even harder to use 2024 as a momentum for a political change. Great. Thanks so much, Nacho. Uh, I want to stick with you in, in going back through in, in reverse order again. One more question for all of our panelists. And, um, you know, all of you have cast judgment uh, or, or, or uh, some doubt, I should say, on uh, the prospects for any sort of negotiations with the Maduro regime, any ability to get uh, Maduro to alter the electoral apparatus in a freer, fairer and more transparent manner. Um, Jose Ignacio, you mentioned that the Maduro regime doesn't have a BATNA, but it has a BATNA, a better alternative to a negotiated agreement. It just sits in power at the moment. It doesn't feel the pressure necessarily because some of the international pressure or, or momentum has been lost. But let's assume that, that the opposition can uh, effectively you know, alter some of the conditions that you, you've been uh, talking about as being so unfree and, and so unfair. Um, I want to ask you a question. It's a little bit controversial, but it's if, if there are any entities in specific that the opposition ought to focus on, let's assume that they can't get all the entities that are part of the apparatus which keeps the Maduro regime in power, which are the ones in your mind that should be most focused on? Um, if there's only small tweaks or small modifications that the opposition will be able to push for between now and, and 2024, which are those entities? Where to focus the efforts? Uh, in my opinion, the Constitutional Chamber of the Venezuelan Supreme Tribunal. Uh, I will, I will uh, say, uh, um, and I, I tell you a, a funny story. It was in a meeting in Venezuela prior to the election, 2015 election uh, with the opposition, trying to analyze uh, possibilities of electoral fraud. And the electoral exp experts were talking about how to avoid electoral fraud, and they talk, and they have a wonderful plan so wonderful that the opposition was able to defeat the Maduro's malpractices in a non-fair election. But at the end of the meeting, I raised my hand and I said, well, that's great. I think that you have a great plan to win the elections. In my opinion, you are going to win the parliamentary elections eventually with a super majority. But the day uh, uh, after you won the election, the constitutional chamber is going to dissolve the National Assembly. And I published a brief open in november 2015 can the constitutional chamber dissolve the national assembly and this is what happened to be honest i don't care about the electoral national council i don't care about criminal courts i don't care about public prosecutor the first and main is constitutional institution that support the constitutionality of this authoritarian regime is the constitutional chamber of the Venezuelan Supreme Tribunal. We can have the best electoral council in the world, but as long as the constitutional chamber is under the political control of Nicolás Maduro, there will be impossible to advance in a constitutional democracy in Venezuela. Alex, your thoughts on this? Is it the TSJ or is there another organization or institution we should be, uh, be looking at? I agree with Jose Ignacio, uh, TSJ is important, but I would focus on another one, but I think it's the hardest one of all. And I feel that the hardest institution to bring back to democracy is the military. And because the military is the wild card in this country, the military is the one who is 100% allied to Maduro, who has permitted everything that he's been doing because the military is both a political and an economic actor. It's not an independent actor at the service of the people anymore. And if you want to bring it back to the elections, Ryan, like, given that the armed forces are so aligned to Maduro regime, it really seems unlikely that Venezuela will improve in terms of physical safety and criminality and actually creating a safe space for democracy advocates to go campaign for a candidate in 2024. I mean, let's be real about this. So I'm not, I'm not sure if people are willing to support an opposition candidate and go out with their, you know, with their little ba banners and everything else when their advocacy can expose them to detention, to abuse, and to even death. So I feel like if the military is not going to be on the side of the people, it's just one less incentive to think this process through. Great. Thank you, Alex. Chris, if you get one institution, uh, which one would it be to, to try to reform? 
Wow, uh, this is like a bad game show. Um, the um, uh, actually, I'm going to make a plug for one, but it's not a Venezuelan institution because it's timely, and that is the uh, mandate of the UN fact-finding mission on Venezuela is coming up, and it's coming due for the UNHRC. It's by no means a perfect institution, but it's shined a bright light. Its investigations have indicated and alleged that there have been crimes against humanity that are now being investigated by the ICC. That's something we can't actually achieve. I agree with Nacho and I agree with Alex. The first thing is probably is going to have to be the Constitutional Court um, and the military are two, you know, one is, well, what is at best a lackey? Um, and the second is certainly a criminal organization, and arguably the first one is is as well. Um, I think if you begin to if you we can, it is within our power as internationalists to advocate for a renewal of the UN fact-finding mission. I would argue that's by no means a magic bullet, but at least it's it's a step forward or continued step of pressure that's going to be important for a lot of the reasons that both Nacho and Alex just mentioned. Great. Thank you, Chris. So I want to drill down and ask you each individually a, a couple of questions that I speak that I think speak to your expertise or your bailiwicks. And I, I want to start with you, uh, Alex, you mentioned security um in in your response as an institution that you'd you'd like to reform for for better democratic prospects we've seen the maduro regime in addition to presiding over a precipitous decline in, in public spending as as we've seen in the most recent protests on the streets in caracas the teachers are out protesting what they call starvation wages things that can't support the canasta basica in in uh in in venezuela you know 21 times the the, the minimum wage is the canasta basica um, and Maduro has taken that money from, from other forms of public spending and channeled it into the internal security apparatus, where, as you said, it's had a devastating impact on the opposition through the reduction of civic and political space. Um, how can the opposition, the U.S. government, and the international community help to protect civil society and human rights defenders from the security services uh, in, in whatever way they, they can, even if in a limited way? I think it's going to be in a limited way unless someone is willing to kind of go defend them physically on the ground. But I'm going to recommend two things. First, it's time to turn up the volume again. I mean, turn up the volume on human rights violations, on the cases of political prisoners, supporting families of victims. I, you know, Ryan Mino discussed this a lot of times. Like, I usually follow all family members of political prisoners on social media because it just, it's a reality check on how abandoned these people feel and how desperate they are to get their loved ones back at home. And when I say turn up the volume, I say, I think we do need to turn up the volume on reminding people that Maduro is being formally under investigation and committing crimes against humanity. I don't think nor the opposition nor the international community say this enough. And it was just only a couple of presidents in Latin America who were actually, you know, willing to say it more. But I feel that the people don't understand this process. The people don't understand how long it's going to take, what's going to be the outcome. And I feel like if it, you know, this, uh, this process really comes to life, um, it can lead to important outcomes that would make Venezuela a little bit closer towards democracy. So one, turning up the volume on everything human rights violation related. And second, I think we need to continue to sanction individual transgressors. And not only the transgressors that are at the top of the chain of command, which is usually what has been done up to the moment, which is fine. But we also need to shoot for those mid-lower levels in the military, in Sevin, in the regime, in TCJ. You know, let's think about sanctioning 2,000 people across the board on those levels. We'll just create chaos for Maduro and his stability and power because people won't be able to get visas. People can't access their bank accounts. People can't pay through Zelle. I mean, this is the type of pressure and the type of disruption that I think we just need to think more out of the box with. So it's not just, you know, hitting the ones up top, it's also hitting these lower levels and in vast majority just to create um, anarchy back for them. Thanks, Alex. And uh, if I had to make an observation about the the administration's sanction policy it seems to be going in the in the other direction as opposed to ramping up uh, sort of on the table in a, in a negotiated type of posture looking to actually uh, climb back from, from, from some of the architecture that's been constructed over the years. Um, Jose Ignacio, uh, I wanna ask you a, a question about human rights. Uh, Chris mentioned the, the, the fact-finding mission. I think it's, it's super important. You and I have done a podcast, Jose Ignacio, about the, uh, the International Criminal Court case um, against Maduro on our 35 West uh, podcast for CSIS. Um, 
how can the international community reinforce the centrality of human rights and human rights victims in the humanitarian approach? In your opinion, what would be a, a strategy to, to do so to keep you know, so human rights and human rights violations and the victims thereof front and center, uh, besides just turning up the volume like, uh, like, like Alex mentioned? A great question. I will say that uh, I will suggest several actions. Action number one, it is necessarily to fight this both truth about the nature of Venezuelan regime. Uh, a few weeks ago, I read a report of a Venezuelan um, a news uh, with a discussion with academics explaining why we shouldn't call Maduro dictator. And when I read that, I say, but I mean, what is the meaning of that? I mean, if we don't call Maduro dictator, so what? How can I pursue justice without truth. Uh, so we need to challenge the path truth that is a path truth based on impunity. Venezuela will not have democracy based on impunity. There is not peace without justice, and there is not justice without truth. So action number one, fight this uh, narrative, and as Alex said, increase the volume of the real nature of Nicolás Maduro, an authoritarian regime, a criminal organization responsible for gross human rights violations. I am not intended to polarize. I, just, I am just intended to have a real assessment of the nature of the problem. Action number two, we need to give human rights victims a voice. They are Hopeless. There is no possibility of justice in Venezuela. Regrettably, the National Assembly decided to defer any uh, restorative justice or transitional justice until the political transition is achieved. But currently, to be honest, I am not sure when and if a political transition in Venezuela is going to be achieved. And we need to realize that the political terms in Venezuela are not the same political terms. Uh, humanitarian times. We can wait for a short two years, three years, four years for an electoral reforms. I clearly understand that political transitions take time, but humanitarian crisis doesn't have that time. So we need to increase the voice of the human rights victims. And for that purpose, we need to think out of the box. It is possible to implement a ad hoc mechanism of reparation of human rights victims, uh, not on uh, when the political transition is achieved, but right now, here and now, and increasing the voice of the human rights victims not only will advance in a transitional justice in Venezuela, will also increase the pressure over Maduro's regime. So I will stop here and just uh, provide you with these two general suggestions. Great, thank you, Jose Ignacio. And Chris, before I come to you with my question, we're getting close, folks, to our Q&A portion of the event. So I wanna remind, remind you that the chat box is open. Uh, there's a, rather, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of our Zoom screen. If you have a question, type it in. Uh, we are monitoring the Q&A box. Alternatively, you can go online and go to the website for the event itself. There's an Ask Live Questions button in which you can type your, your question. Uh, we'll be getting to the Q&A portion of the event uh, shortly. Chris, uh, a key element of the democracy playbook is, of course, uh, political participation, who participates. Um, and currently, there are more than 6 million people abroad um, who are, in theory, eligible to vote in Venezuela. But if the opposition is going to use the current voter registry for voters abroad, there are only about 100,000 people registered. Uh, political negotiation probably needs to take place to assure that the, the vote abroad is guaranteed, uh, to, to ensure that rather that that constitutional guarantee is honored and to set the guidelines. And so in your opinion, uh, in what ways can, Venice, can the Venezuelan diaspora be included uh, in, in 2024? What specific steps can be taken to ensure political participation uh, realistically uh, in, in the run up to 2024? Thank you. Let me just go back quickly, uh, and I'll be quick on both answers because I know there are comments in the comments box, uh, questions. Um, the, the first thing is, is you know, uh, what can be done to promote human rights right now and refocus? And I agree with with Alex to paraphrase, pump up the volume. This also was a, a dance song. Um, the um, 
it needs to be done. Uh, and, and that includes the voices of the victims, the voice of the family's victims. It also needs to include, um, if you will, a broader range of governments from within the region. And I think, I think European Social Democrats, Canadians uh, need to reach out to groups like, well, to individuals like Petro or Boric and others, so they begin to recognize this. They don't have to em embrace sort of any transition strategy, but to serve as advocates for human rights, since they themselves oftentimes have been victims of human rights abuses. I think that's important. The second is, is again, we, we're looking at a, not to refer always to the UNHRC, it is, you know, it, it, for all, it has plenty of problems, but right now Chile is up for a position on the UNHRC that would replace Venezuela. I think that needs to be uh, encouraged again, if we can get some sort of international broker that has multilateral credibility, um, if not, maybe not teeth, I think that's important. Um, the, the third thing I'd recommend on human rights is, you know, as this administration, the, the Biden administration, uh, is obviously engaging in negotiations with a couple of oil companies, one in particular that's been investing for a while. Why not say, look, we'll, we'll expand your license, um, but you know what, I expect you to speak out on human rights. Um, you know, you can't just go there, um, ask us and demand that we roll back our sanctions to allow you to engage in business with PDVSA. Um, we actually will have some demands of our own we want to impose on you. Uh, and one is that you provide either support for human rights, um, financial support for human rights groups, uh, provide a forum, uh, enlist or even support international uh, uh, platforms for human rights uh, victims to be able to speak. I, 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 well, honestly, I don't name the company. Chevron shouldn't be able to make these demands cost free. Um, one of the questions and comments in, in the Q&A is, well, can we preserve a policy that's based on principle when there's so much need for oil? Let's be honest. The oil that's going to be pumped out of Venezuela in the short term is not going to be enough to really change oil markets. So this isn't really about geopolitics. It's about one company that's been invested in there for a long time and wants to make good on their investments. And so I think, you know, let's, no pun intended, we should have put them over a barrel um, and actually demand that they... Uh, provide some sort of support for human rights if they're going to get what they want. Um, to your point about political participation in the diaspora, I'll just say this quickly. Yes, you're right. Um, the voter election rolls are severely undercounted right now. And I think it's an argument for some level of international engagement with the government. You cannot get, um, you know, in the case of the two million or so Venezuelans that are in Colombia, um, you're going to need to set up some consular services so that they don't all have to make that treacherous trek across the border so they can vote. Um, you've got you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Venezuelans in Spain, obviously also in the United States. These are opportunities for these governments to engage, but also to engage in a way that puts, again, pressure on them. Yes, we will not recognize the mother of the government, perhaps. We'll engage you on instances of substance to help improve consular services. But the cost is you need to actually allow or try to pretend to allow at least. I don't think they'll do it un you know, uh, without a fight your citizens, because they are, let's be honest, they're citizens of Venezuela to be able to vote in the elections. And that's another leverage point the international community can and should be using um, around these elections. Again, that may not be successful, but it's an important lever leverage point that we have. And it's not just around 2024, it should start happening now. Ryan, do you mind if I add something to what Chris just said? Excellent. Go ahead, Alex. Jump in. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we all agree that Venezuelan diaspora needs to be allowed to void, vote. It's six million people. Like I've heard from many people before, the most populated state of Venezuela is outside of Venezuela. So I think that's something that we all must recognize. But let's say we, you know, whatever, a miracle happens and we figure out all the logistics to give the opportunity for Venezuelan diaspora to vote. There are still two major concerns I have on top of mine. First, Venezuela's lack of trust in the electoral process. I think we would need to focus on giving the op giving the people, you know, certainty that their information will not be used against them, that the Maduro regime will not be able to get it, that they're not going to be reported to immigration authorities and receiving um, countries that they're in irregular status. Like we would need to build trust in the process again in order for diaspora to be absolutely excited and engaged to go forward. And then second. I think that there's this huge elephant in the room that we have not yet figured out is that Venezuelans today have limited access to their identity documents. So like if we in Venezuela, you know, we vote with a cellula and a passport for the 2024 election, what are we going to do when there are so there are millions of people who don't have a solution towards this? Because Simon does, breaks down every three months and violates the right to identity because during the 40-day trip you took walking and traveling to the United States, 
someone stole your password or someone, you know, got lost your cellula. So even though if we're able to figure out absolutely everything of like a logistical electoral process standard, I think we need to address these two concerns of the Venezuelan diaspora to actually get them much more motivated and engaged to, to participate. Great. Thank you, Alex. So I want to remind our, our listeners um, and, and, and viewers, the Q&A box is open. It's active. Uh, so is the, the website. We're going to begin uh, the, the Q&A portion of, of the event with a question from uh, Carlos Sanchez to you specifically, Alex, but I'd welcome uh, other folks weighing in as well. Um, and, and Carlos asks, um, how can Venezuelans elect or promote new leaders that represent a real unified opposition? And I think this is a question um, about process. Um, what does is, what is that process look like or, or how, do, how is that process constructed? That's how I interpret this question. I think the most basic one is renewal of leadership within the political parties and the basis and allowing for representation to happen. As I said before, the candidate who's probably going to run in 2024 is probably going to be the same candidate that ran in 2006. Like if these people are not understanding that new blood and new leadership has to come in and has to be a part of a broad, wider or broader generation, I, I mean, let's like it's time for the next generation to kind of step in and with this i'm not saying let's eliminate the last generation not at all i mean the last generation has learned so much and it's so valuable but i think juan guaido represents a new generation and he has gotten us as farther as we could have ever imagined up to the moment with his flaws and his pros and his cons i'm not going to get into that but i think it's just an example of how renewal within political parties has to happen and has to happen now so that people can get excited about the election Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Chris, uh, Nacho, anything to add about the, the process question from Carlos? No? Okay. Um, let's move on to, to the next one. And I'm going through the, the question and answer box here. There was one that Chris pointed out about uh, recent outreach from the United States government to the Maduro regime, specifically on the question of, of global energy security and what Venezuela could produce uh, to contribute to, to global energy security. So I will skip over that question because I believe Chris uh, answered it by saying it would be uh, uh, pretty much negligible um, on an international scale. But the next question after that is from uh, Pedro Burelli, uh, who asks, uh, what, if the, what is the impact then of this outreach um, of the US government engaging directly and behind the scenes with the Maduro regime um, with a, a, a confusing agenda uh, or an agenda that seems to be focused mostly on on short-term energy needs. So, what what's been the impact, um, let's say, on on democracy prospects uh, in Venezuela of some of this short-term outreach from the U.S. government? And I'll start with you, Nacho, and uh, and then ask Alex and and Chris to weigh in. I will say that the problem is not whether the United States government uh, um, could engage with Maduro regime. The real problem is the lack of a clear strategy regarding that um, engagement in the, and the lack of transparency. And uh, regrettably, uh, these uh, engagements between Biden administration and Maduro are favoring this change of narrative in Venezuela, therefore are creating incentive to avoid political negotiation in Mexico. Uh, Maduro is now aware that without any concession, without any improvement, he was able to resume negotiate uh, conversation with the United States government. He has even been able to uh, obtain some favorable conditions, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, license or, or letter of conformity to European oil companies, eventually the Chevron license. So again, I will say that uh, it will great that the United States government engaged uh, with Maduro's criminal elite as long as this engagement helps to foster the narrative about the criminal nature of Maduro's regime and create incentive for a negotiation. Otherwise, this kinds of approach will end in a total different outcome, which is uh, create an incentive to Maduro to avoid negotiations in Mexico. Chris, do you have anything to add uh, to what Nacho said about the recent engagement that we've seen and, and its uh, effects or, or, or lack thereof on democracy prospects? 
Uh, first, to say hello to Pedro. I expected a question from Pedro, of course. Um, the um, uh, I agree with Nacho. I mean, one hopes is a broader strategy that's that's at work here. Um, I don't know. And one hopes that there's uh, sort of a whole set of negotiations that are going on under the table um, that would lead to return negotiations and even some sort of a clear set of, of uh, what those discussions would produce or where they're leading. But we haven't heard. And so, as Nacho says, absent any understanding or clear articulation of that strategy, certainly the impression is that we've given something away, mostly sort of a, a certain amount of uh international legitimacy which we know Maduro craves without getting much in return uh and i think that's having said that i'm not opposed to engaging some form of negotiations and trying to open up channels but so far the returns have been pretty minimal and the uh, seeming uh gains for in particular uh private companies have been quite large so you know maybe there's something up their sleeve i think we'll have to wait and see but again i'd like to see all of this discussed uh and not all diplomacy can be conducted out in the open but i would like to see some setting of a context of what what where, where are we heading otherwise it can lead to people like ryan mocking this administration for being too optimistic or too naive even um maybe that's true i don't know alex anything to add um, I absolutely agree with Chris and Jose Ignacio. I think the only thing I'd add is I'd never imagine seeing an administration giving Maduro more time and more leverage. And I think that's, that just concludes the sentiment of millions of Venezuelans who have always seen the United States administration as a pillar for democracy. And um, yeah, I'll end it there. Let's <laughs> not be more controversial. <laughs> Great. I think there's a follow on question here in our in our Q&A and uh, I'll make the segue or try to make the segue it comes from Amy Manson and, and she's asking about political prisoners, uh, because I think it's important to remember one of the reasons that was given uh, as justification by the US government for reaching out to the regime um, was on the basis of political prisoners. It wasn't just the global energy security issue um, around the time of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was also on the political prisoners angle and and uh, all of us will remember that you know two political prisoners uh, were brought home after that initial visit in in March of course now we've seen the regime take uh, three new political prisoners so net we're down uh, minus one um, Amy is asking you know in the absence of a U.S embassy or a consulate um, these citizens seem to be kind of on on their own um, what can be done to help support illegally detained U.S citizens and I would add to her question, what can be done beyond sort of sanctions relief? Because it does seem to be the way in which the government is currently thinking about uh, approaching negotiations for unjustly detained Americans. And I, I'll start with you, uh, Nacho. I know you, your time is limited and you have to go. So if this is your, your last response, uh, I'll start start with you, Nacho. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to, to being forced to leave early. Um, I will, I will, I am absolutely agree with, with Chris' observation uh, in, in the sense that, again, the problem is not sanctions relief. The problem is not a sanction to all companies, a license, sorry, to all um, companies. The problem is the lack of incentive are related to oil licenses. And until now, for instance, general license 14 uh, or the letter of conformity to European oil companies, those relief has been granted without conditions in terms of transparency, in terms of humanitarian aid, and without a genuine advance in a democratic transition by Maduro's regime. So I will use those incentives in terms of sanctions and block, block assets to force Maduro to move uh, towards a genuine transition with real manifestations in that sense, as for instance, the liberation of political prisoners. For instance, uh, and I will speak loud here, Maduro is interested in have access to gold deposit in the Bank of England. Well, from a legal perspective, there are several, several uh, venues to achieve that objective, but it is necessary to have the set of conditions that from one side assure transparency, we don't want to feed a kleptocracy regime. And second, humanitarian actions in terms of liberation of political prisoners, supply of humanitarian aid in Venezuela, 
and regrettably, this is not the terms of the discussion. The terms of the discussion in this post truth in Venezuela is that it's necessarily to uh, uh, flexibilize sanctions without conditions, without improvement. And this is why, again, Maduro, in my opinion, doesn't have any incentive to genuine advance in human rights in terms of human rights abuses. Thank you so much, Nacho. And I, I know you have to go now because of time constraints, but we really appreciate uh, your, your time here today. You've, you've really been an excellent panelist. Thank you My so pleasure. much for your contributions. My pleasure. Stay in touch. Bye-bye. I'm sorry again that I have to leave. No problem. So, uh, Chris and, and Alex, um, on the question of unjustly detained Americans, which we've seen the regime use as a source of leverage, yet another source of leverage and perhaps another region, reason, as Nacho mentioned, for his BATNA, the, the better alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, what to do about, about these unjustly detained Americans? What other levers or mechanisms are there uh, besides the sanctions to advocate for them and, and to eventually earn their, their release? And Alex, I'll start with you and then, and then go to Chris. I, I think I said it before. I feel like um, it's turning up the volume on these human rights violations. And I think, I think the United States has to have a stronger stance on all crimes against humanity. And I feel like if we can also, if the United States can also engage the ICC and all of those groups that are working towards that investigation, I just, I just feel like the United States can be better at asserting its leadership on these topics and that more pressure has to be made. I mean, I think it's what's, cr what's crazy for Venezuelans is that we came from an administration that was maximum pressure. And then now we're in an administration that is in, you know, very low, low, low pressure. So I think there needs to be a balance there to actually get the outcomes and the results they need, but also take into consideration that you're not going to go negotiate other things that are going to go in detriment of the Venezuelan people as well, because that's something that I, um, I fear a bit. I mean, what can come? Of course, we want all American citizens and we want all of our political prisoners to be free without a doubt. But what is the Maduro regime going to ask for in change? So I think that's something that needs to be discussed as well. Thanks, Alex. Chris? Yeah, first of all, I agree with Alex. I mean, we've got sort of a policies that go from zero to, to 11, to quote Spinal Tap, um, with nothing in between. And we've gone back down to zero, we've gone from 11 to zero. Um, and it has to be something in between. Uh, and I'm going to sound a little bit callous here, and I don't mean to to uh, dismiss any of the suffering that the families of the hostages are undergoing. But um, you know, it, it is a question. Uh, these are U.S. citizens; they demand uh, U.S. support. But you know, why um, why will we allow an entire policy, indeed, uh, 28 million people, Venezuelans, being held hostage to uh, you know a hostage policy that's very much working to Maduro's benefit? He's using it as a distraction. He's using it to squeeze concessions. Uh, maybe those concessions can be better placed for a broader policy change rather than the individuals. And I, and I know this is probably anathema to say, and the truth is that some of these hostages, let's be honest, were ones that, you know, had engaged in trying to attack an oil facility, try to stage some sort of, uh, you know, uh, coup that seems like attempted invasion that seems like something out of Woody Allen's Bananas. Um, you know, these are not people that which we should be necessarily holding a U.S. policy uh, victim or hostage to. So, you know, I, I understand. And again, there the Sitco five are clearly uh, victims, but but I think we need to think a little more broadly. You know, maybe the, again, maybe there's more work, but we simply don't know, and that's part of the problem. Is again, it leads to a lot of guesswork. And again, I think we do need that sense of a, of a whole roadmap. Of, of what is being demanded and what we what where we want to go because it's not just uh, U.S. policies. Obviously, the human rights of of, of thousands of, of Venezuelans. You know, and I often remember how you know, there were a couple people on the left that loved in the 1990s before your time, Ryan, uh, that loved to show up at every U.S. meeting on on uh, uh, Peru and talk about Lori Berenson. Well, you know. She was <laughs> she was collaborating with the guerrilla group. Um, so you know, I think we need to have some perspective on what our broader policy objectives are. Thanks, Chris. Uh, also, thanks for reminding everybody of of my youth, and it really really does make me feel young again. I appreciate that, Chris. Um, my my age certainly uh, does begs to differ. However, um, we've got a great question from uh, Jesualdo Barbosa. Uh, in the Q&A box, and it gets us back to the theme of the democracy playbook as well. And also it gets into the sort of insider of some of the splits 
not just within the opposition, which I think we've thoroughly discussed uh, this morning, but actually some of the splits that might be within the regime itself, because I think we often tend to assume that the regime is a sort of unified monolith and that, and that Maduro calls all the shots without any sort of uh, opposition from within. And so Hesualu uh, asks, um, I want to know what your opinion is about supporting a political change from inside of the Chavista regime. We start to see divisions inside the party supporting candidate from, from inside. Is that a potential option? And uh, Alex, I'll, I'll start with you because I know you've done a lot of thinking on you know cracks within the regime and whether they actually mean anything for democratic prospects. And then I'll go to Chris. I, I I want to believe that cracks with I mean of course there are cracks within the regime that those cracks become uh like they they fall into a democratic outcome is where I'm a little bit more skeptic and and I had hopes at very long time ago with all of these indictments and actually a dollar sign on Maluto's head you would think of more cracks happening within the regime to actually like make sure oust him out or anything else but it. It just hasn't happened because we can't forget that the Maduro regime is, uh, you know, criminal mafia state who will stick together in order to, you know, continue with transnational drug crime and transnational human rights violations. I mean, it's a bigger piece of the pie than what we think of Besouf, as we would see it out. There are also interests from Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Cuba involved. So. It's going to be harder for them internally to break apart, um, but I welcome that only if it's for a democratic transition. If it's for also to bring in another, you know, crazy guy to sit that chair, forget it on my side. So those are just my two cents. Thanks, Alex. Uh, what's your take on um, schisms within the the regime, Chris? Uh, it's yeah, I agree with what Alex said. Um, this is not you know when we think about schisms within a regime, a ruling clique. It could lead to a democratic transition. We're often thinking about more along the lines of, say, uh, democratic transitions in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, the Maduro government's a different animal altogether. This is a criminal enterprise. Um, you know, you, the, uh, you know, the, a lot of if there's schisms, a lot of them are going to be seeking to preserve their own skins and their own Ill ill-gotten gains. And so, it's not like you, you know, there's an element of wanting to preserve. Uh, self-preservation that isn't true, say, in the case of Argentina or Chile and other places uh, in the 1970s and 80s, um, 1980s primarily. The, um, so first of all, I think it's, we can't rely too much on that. I think the second, though, is, is, that, is, is yes, so I think we need to be very cautious about some sort of puppet or shadow candidate that's launched that's not Maduro, but still is sort of seeking to, it's already compromised uh, with the regime. Having said that, I think we look more towards the schisms in terms of trying to preserve some sort of institutionality around not not a, an alternative, not a non Maduro, not a Maduro government without Maduro, but some sort of schisms that will be willing to support some sort of institutionality, whether it's elections or judicial reform or whatever, um, rather than uh, a sort of a Chavista non Maduro candidate, because I think that 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 can be, as I say, uh, a very much of a red herring. Great. Uh, we have a couple more really good questions. We have 10 minutes left. Um, one of them comes from uh, Gilbert Guerra. I think uh, th this is the Gil Guerra who used to be a, a, a colleague of mine at my my old think tank. Uh, it's good, good to see you in the chat box, Gil. And he asks, um, how could U.S. refugee policy serve to strengthen the democracy playbook in Venezuela? So this is a diaspora question. Um, Given the concerns around voting from abroad, Alex mentioned earlier, what is the correct balance between providing Venezuelans refuge and facilitating the conditions for them to return and attempt to improve conditions in Venezuela from within? I think it's a really good question about, about balance. Um, Chris, can I ask you to start on this one since I had Alex go uh, first last time? Uh, I w could I get a phone call to check? Because this one's a tough one. I, I really don't. Hard question, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this is a tough one. It's a good, it, it's very good because you're absolutely right. And in, in, in the one, I mean, it, this is, doesn't answer the question, but it reminds me that when we think about it, because it goes, I was looking at the chat box. There's a question like, how do you create this group of friends with consequences? Um, you know, one of the things in some should be is recognizing that refugees flow 
for where there are these uh, deteriorating democracies, Venezuela, Nicaragua, what have you. And that is, is, is a point of discussion that neighboring countries should be having. It should be sort of, if you will, a justification for why we need to understand and flesh out uh, the, these um, sort of steps towards towards autocracy. Um, that doesn't answer the question, though. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it, it again gets to the point where you don't want to send them back. They're refugees. And, and, and may I just give a shout out to, to President Petro, who said that he wasn't going to roll back Colombia's asylum policy at the request. And that's very positive. We may have our suspicions about Petro, but that's one positive sign. Uh, and the U.S. obviously should follow suit in this case, is not sort of send back refugees. Um, I, I think um, I think having some sort of policy, accelerated policy, that both pressure provides international pressure because the U.S. is not alone in this. It's regional. It's European. Not Spain. I mean, there. I can even in the U.K. There are lots of Venezuelans um, the world over um, that should be voting, and so that should be a point of again leverage uh, that. As refugees arrive, they should be able to be allowed to vote, and it should be a point of leverage uh, with their sending country governments in terms of negotiating uh, elections uh, and their right to vote and consular services. Alex, uh, what's your thought on the proper balance here? You've had the benefit of a little bit of time to think about it, but it is a tough question. It is a tough question, and I think I like to address it in two parts. The first, I think we need to recognize that temporary protective status for Venezuelans in the United States is a, has been a good way to go. And the fact that they've been co continuing to expand on that measure is amazing and applauses to the Biden administration on that. I think we, we have to recognize that. But the second thing is, those are people who entered this country legally. What, what is happening with the Venezuelan migrants who are entering this country illegally? Because I feel that they are being caught between a political battle within Democrats and Republicans. I think it's not a surprise for anyone. All of the images and the videos we've been seeing of, you know, buses coming from Texas or to Washington, D.C. or to, um, of course, to New York. I volunteered at Union Station. I've seen what they've been going through. And I think that's something that just needs to be resolved. And there needs to be better measures to find a way to give them regular status or to give them temporary protective status to give, to help them find a job, to help them find refuge. Because today, for example, in Washington, D.C., only NGOs are actually attacking that situation. I mean, Mayor Bowser already had two neglected um, um, requests from the Pentagon, but I think more needs to be done there. Because, and I'm going to read these statistics, I look for them. According to the Organization of American States, from J January to July of 2022, if 44,943 migrants have crossed the Selva del Darien. And that's all the, the with the with the expectation that they survive, they're going to reach the United States. That's 6,000 people per month, 214 per day, and nine per hour. So I think there needs to be better policy on how we're addressing migrants and refugees within the United States borders, because what we just can't have them be is political bait between Republicans and Democrats. So. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I want to end on the question that Chris mentioned. I think he saw it in the in the Q&A box uh, from Edgardo Romero Chineros, which is about how to organize uh, the, the, the coalition of the willing or the group of friends who want to turn up the volume on Venezuela. Right. In the backdrop of this entire conversation, we've discussed on you know how the international pressure, we've taken our foot off the gas a little bit, a new constellation of presidents say, in the Western Hemisphere, it might not be as gung ho about pressuring the regime. Things have changed since 2019, um, but there seems to be still this idea that we can find a coalition of the willing. It's not as large as it used to be, uh, but it's still there as 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 a, a strong you know potential action. And so, how to organize the group of friends with consequences, to use Chris's term? And uh, I'll start with you, Alex, and then and then I'll go to to Chris. I mean, I think we have to start with rallying up the international support that we used to have in 2019. I feel that that group of friends has dwindled away. I feel that, unfortunately, there have been leftist leftist shifts in the region and more coming if, depending on what happens with Brazil. So I think creating the incentives in order to rally this group of friends better within Latin America and internationally, I think it'd just be my two cents to start. 
Chris, uh, what are your thoughts? On... I was hoping Alice was going to talk longer, <laughs> so I have more time to think. Um, the um, <laughs> so you know, first of all, uh, just a little bit of history. This was before my time, Ryan. So don't get feeling too young. Um, in the in the Santiago Declaration, nineteen ninety one, uh, the, the OES Resolution ten eighty, the big proponent of that was actually the Venezuelan government at the time, which had just experienced a coup d'état, coup attempt, um, and it was looking over its shoulder and it was scared of the military. Um, and that became a leader, ironically enough, for a democracy clause in the OAS. Um, that same incentive could be used today if played properly, because the truth is, is the, the, the autocrat's playbook, dictator's playbook, is not just for those of the left. Bolsonaro uses it too. Um, and we don't even know what ideology Bukele is. Um, and so the truth is, is you know, it, the consolidation of power can be wielded by anyone. It can be wielded against anyone. So I think, first of all, it's necessary to find that this is something in the interests of, we're not talking preserving the neoliberal order, we're not talking about preserving exclusion, um, we're talking about preserving basic fundamental rights for people that are essential to address issues of uh, social social inclusion and, and development. And so, first of all, within the region, and, and beginning to bring in, if you will, sort of, Alex mentioned a lot of the governments that have committed and leftists that have cast doubts on this, begin to bring in social democrats from Europe and other places um, who have a certain credibility on these issues to be able to talk, and then from that begin to build sort of basic points of consensus. And from that say, look, we, we not demanding that we'll slap on sanctions, but there will be coordinated discussions around these efforts, and there will be, among only the willing, there will also be um a plan to define them and then when they're violated call them out in a public way um you know that may mean at the minimum uh to quote uh, um team america a strongly worded memo um but uh you know at least beginning to recognize and acknowledge that countries are on a slippery slope towards autocracy can do something uh, it's not to be because right now we've been silent we've ignored it and then we you know, we wring our hands and gnash our teeth when we look at Ortega and say, oh my God, how did this happen? We knew it was happening. I said it before. The second is, is I do think also um, you begin to pull people on notice when you do this. Uh, and even within, and you start to build in civil society organizations within these countries that can then say, wow, you know, now, now we see why. I think that's sort of the first step to begin is at least articulate. And at the very least, you know, the Council of Europe, and the UK is still kind of considered itself part of Europe. Um, you know, when it calls out human rights abuses under its own um, human rights charter, it actually sends recommendations. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't sanction, but it, it does send a public document that says you should do X, Y, and Z. I think that's a fairly, yes, it's pretty, it's pretty tepid, but it's a pretty good model. And it's much better sometimes than asking for the whole enchilada. Uh, or the whole arepa, I guess, in this case, in the case of Venezuela, it's better. Yeah, of course, the um, it, it's better um, because it begins to sort of uh, put countries on alert before the sanctions hit. Thanks, right, Chris. And I know, I know you want to jump in. I know you want to jump in real quick here, Alex. Uh, and th thanks for your contributions, Chris. And I think you know the young kids, the kids who are even younger than me. You know, they they call that putting them on blast. Uh, Alex, uh, your thirty seconds. Comments. Yep. Thirty seconds, because. Just to bring what Chris was saying from an international perspective to life in Venezuela, the fact that we are most likely going to lose the ambassador and the organization of American states is not just, just does not just mean impact for Venezuela, but it also means impact for multilateralism and whole. Because that institution regrettably can be replaced by Foro de Sao Paulo, CELAC, Mercosur, and then you're going to be seeing other geopolitics come into play. So we need the, the, that group of friends more than ever because these things can happen in 2022. So it's urgent. Thank you everyone very much for uh, joining us uh, this morning for what was a very wide ranging conversation about uh, the democracy playbook uh, in Venezuela. I know he's left us now, but I wanna thank our first speaker, Jose Ignacio Hernandez, a former special prosecutor for the interim government of Venezuela and a visiting fellow at Harvard Growth Lab. Alex Winkler, non-resident senior associate with CSIS and the former deputy mayor of El Latillo, and Chris Sabatini, the senior research fellow for Latin America, US, and the Americas program at Chatham House. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again soon.